In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you know that when we give a sermon, when any priest gives a sermon, he usually tells you some sort of lesson, something from Holy Scripture, something about our Lord or the saints, and then after that he says, now, what are you going to do in your own life about that? What are you going to change in your own life based on that? So I would like to start with that part today and then perhaps go back to talking about our Lord as Christ the King. So if you ever made a retreat, Ignatian retreat, you know that on the, uh, the third day after you've made your confession, there's a conference called The Call of Christ the King. In that conference, the priest tells you, what, is it, what good is it to establish the reign of Christ the King here on earth if you don't have the reign of Christ the King established in your soul? And that's a very big point, very strong point. It means it's all well and good for me to say how Catholic is the church, how Catholic is our government and country, how Catholic is my place of work, how Catholic is my school, how Catholic are my friends, etc. But if I don't have my soul being very, very Catholic, it sort of doesn't profit me anything. And by the way, our church, at least in the present material circumstances, is not very Catholic anymore. It is Catholic, it's the Bride of Christ, and it shall never be stained. But that's what you're doing here. It's not what the major part of Catholics are doing in the world. So the Catholic Church will always survive, it will always be the Bride of Christ, it will always be pure. Our Lord is with his church until the end of times. But we know that what's coming out of our rulers of the church nowadays is not Catholic. Once in a while, once in a while, there's something. So, um, you know, don't bank on that one. The next one is our government and our countries. I don't think they're very Catholic anymore. That all changed about, I don't know, 500 years ago, something like that. Uh, so you can't bank, you know, you can't trust in that either. The society around us, maybe you have some good Catholic friends. My experience in this country is that there are a lot of good people here. Uh, uh, and I actually seem to have some Christian values and Christian ways of behaving, which is very nice. But when, I, when, uh, when it comes right down the line, I can tell that they're not baptized Catholics who are attending the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So I really can't trust in that one either. Uh, it really does come down to, what am I doing to make sure that the reign of Christ happens? So, um, I was just teaching someone in catechism a few days ago that we have to avoid occasions of sin. Now, that may not sound very big and very grand uh, when I put it up against our Lord Jesus Christ must reign in society. Our Lord Jesus Christ must reign in his church, must reign in governments, must reign in the, 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 the ambience around us. Uh, and all I say is, okay, let's start by making you, making all of us, avoid the occasions of sin. Suddenly that doesn't sound so grand anymore, and it sounds um, even a little bit um, tiny, uh, minuscule, etc. Like un unconsequential, it sounds unconsequential. But that's not true. It's very, very consequential. So you know that some occasions of sin uh, we cannot avoid, some occasions of sin are quite avoidable and not necessary at all. Some occasions of sin make us sin all the time. Others make us sin only some of the time. And then you can put these combinations together, necessary, uh, proximate, necessary, remote, unnecessary, proximate, just one big scientific equation there. Well, the, the worst situation is when you, you, you have to be in, a, in an occasion of sin, usually by going to work and somebody there is going to, talk evil to you, and every time that person talks that way with you, it makes you have bad thoughts or angry thoughts, and you participate in the gossip, etc. That's what you call necessary occasion of sin, and it's unavoidable. But a lot of times, that's not the case. A lot of times, the occasions of sin are voluntary. We do it on our own, and, uh, and um, a lot of times, they're also making a sin all the time. That's where we can show our generosity towards our Lord and towards our Holy Mother, is when we avoid that. And that's sacrifice. That's sacrifice. You may not think that that is establishing the reign of Christ the King, but in fact it is. Because, as I say many times in this same place, 
If we're not constantly sort of uh, shedding away from us our attachment to this world, attachment to ourselves, attachment to evil things in any way, if we're not constantly sort of shedding that evil skin off of ourselves, well then our Lord does not have a place in our heart where he can reign. And here's where I might as well go to some of the more profound things I was going to say today, which is the confrontation or the encounter between our blessed Lord and Pontius Pilate, that we just recalled in the Gospel today, is dealing exactly with this. You know, Pontius Pilate, I don't think he was so threatened by our Lord, okay? Our Lord's own people were threatened by him, and also just because of his goodness and because of his claim to be king and God, uh, they didn't want him. They were, they were dismayed at him. They were demoralized by him. They wanted some big knight in shining armor, you know, to rule their people, not a humble carpenter. Um, so his own people were threatened by him. Pontius Pilate, not so much. But Pontius Pilate was the ruler of Judea, so he heard the story of the Jews, God's own people against him. Uh, and they said, this man has said he's a king. He's also, you know, you should be threatened by that, Pontius, because you're supposed to be the king here. And Pontius Pilate said, yeah, yeah, whatever, okay. So I'll ask him, are you a king? And our Lord finally tells him, well, yes, but not of this world. You have nothing to fear from me, Pontius Pilate. I, I don't have a big army that's going to come in and take over your power. I, don't, I do not practice intrigue whereby I will make some deception and take over your power. I'm not even jealous for your power. So don't worry. This is not the problem. My kingdom is not of this world. What our Lord wishes to say is that it's got to be in here. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is within you, our Lord says. His reign is within us. And this is the reign that really matters. Uh, let's say it first of all matters. The others matter very much too. But I think our problem a lot of times is we say, well, hey, if I don't see Christ ruling in me, ruling around me, all around me in society, someplace or else, someplace or other, you know, my work, my friends, church, you know, the big church, the one with millions of people in it, um, and um, government, how does Christ expect me to have him ruling in my own soul? And that's what I'll tell you is, uh, don't wait for the next guy to do it. Don't wait for a hundred other people to do it. Don't wait for a thousand other people to do it. Uh, our Lord called his apostles, and he expected each one of them to respond to his voice because he was calling them for his father. <clears throat> our Lord has called all of us to his fold, and uh, we have been baptized into it, and he expects all of us to continue to respond to his voice making him the king of our soul. <clears throat> when we were baptized, we took off the mark on our soul whereby we be belonged to the devil, literally. We belonged to the devil, belonged to the devil when we were born. But by baptism, that mark of the devil, that ownership of the devil was taken away and the mark of Christ was put on our soul. We were baptized into his death. Now, that might sound like a kind of a contradictory statement. Baptism means coming to life, doesn't it? Taking off the, the seal or the, the slavery of Satan and giving me the life of Christ. What is, this about, what is this about being baptized into his death? Well, those are the very words of St. Paul. It means, yes, we have life because of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. Uh, but it was a sacrifice and it was, it was his death. And now, as we live in our Lord Jesus Christ, we will continue to sacrifice ourselves along with him uh, in order to be sanctified. There it is. You have to shed off that pride, shed off that attachment to this world, shed off your inclination to things which are evil, because all of that is not making a king out of our Lord in your soul. And we don't wait for the next guy to do it. We do it because we are baptized and we... Uh, Obligation is a big word. We have the, the honor and the glory to make our Lord Jesus Christ the king in our soul. So we must avoid the occasions of sin. Christ will not live in society around us until he lives, first of all, in our soul. Then I want to tell you that 
we, we leave the occasions of sin as humiliating as that may be. And then we do everything we can to make sure that our Lord lives in us by our obligations and our duties. We want to make sure that he lives in us by our life of prayer. We want to make sure that he lives in us by our faithfulness to our particular state in life. Whether you're married or you're unmarried or you're a priest or religious, our Lord has to live in you. And by establishing his reign in your soul, you can expect that he's going to establish his reign more and more in society around us. So that's really uh, what I wanted to tell you as far as conclusions or um, resolutions that we take from this sermon. But let's understand a little bit more about the kingship of our Lord. Now, so when the angel Gabriel came to Our Lady to announce to her that she would become the mother of God, he said, the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there should be no end. Saint Gabriel is announcing that our Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish a kingdom of souls, which I was just talking about. These go on forever with the life of Christ, the reign of Christ in them. Our Lord lived in lowliness and humility, but he was always conscious of his royal dignity. And when he went to his passion, it became very, very clear. When Pontius Pilate asked him if he was a king, he said, yes, I am. And how did our Lord, first of all, show his royalty or the fact that he was king? Well, it was on the cross. Uh, what was his first crown or what is the crown that he wears? It is the crown of thorns. In fact, you know, uh, there's some rules on this, but I don't see it always being followed. We don't normally picture our Lord with a golden crown. We picture him with a crown of thorns, but someday uh, when we see him in heaven, he will be wearing the golden crown. But right now he goes through suffering, and we're expected to go through suffering with him to make him this kind of king. So he declared before Pontius Pilate, I am a king. Within a few hours, he was wearing the crown of thorns, and he was on a cross with the title above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You probably know that, that when we have that uh, abbreviation on the cross of our Lord, it says I-N-R-I. -I. Uh, that means in Latin, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. So, some might say Pontius Pilate put that, put that there out of mockery. Some might say he put that there to irritate the Jews. Uh, some might say he put, there in, in, put that there in justice. Uh, he really believed our Lord was king of the Jews, and he was being crucified for that because they didn't want to accept their own king. Uh, they, they did tell him to take it down uh, or change the words, and he said, no, it's done. Uh, but the point is, the first time we see our Lord being called a king by the whole world, and not just the Jewish world, but also the Roman world, is when they're declaring his kingship at his death. He's king of the Jews, and that's his charge against him. Now, we see in that that <laughs> the only way our Lord is going to be king, the only way he's pleased to be king in this world is by his death. And if he's going to be king in our souls, he wants to be king in our souls by our crucifixion along with them. And St. Paul calls that uh, daily, I, I am crucified with Christ. It means daily, I make sacrifices against whatever it was for him, his pride, anger, impatience, whatever. Uh, and that's what sanctified the Christians. Same thing with us. Christ is going to be king in our soul by us accompanying him in the passion. And uh, if you're going to look at a, a throne, which definitely dominates the whole world, not just, just during the time he was living, but from before and, be, and after, it's definitely the crucifix or the cross. And no king sets higher on his throne than does our blessed Lord on the cross. He's ruling. It may be the position of a criminal uh, put to death, but we all have to admit that he's definitely dominating the whole world as he dies to become our king. 
In glory and majesty, Christ entered his kingdom on Ascension Day. In the creed, we say, he sitteth at the right hand of God, the, um, the Almighty Father. Christ remains king of the world unto the end of time. Then will he return with great power and majesty to judge the living and the dead. So, by our Lord being so obedient to the will of his Father uh, and... Um, accepting all the punishment for our sins, accepting all the suffering that would pay for our sins. This is what made him king. Our Lord is king because he's God and creator. Our Lord is king because his divine nature anoints his human nature. And our Lord is king because he won it. He suffered for it. So that in particular is what I'm focusing right now, focusing on right now. By him dying on the cross, he accepted everything that was necessary to conquer our souls, therefore he's king over our souls. And uh, it's not just a, um, a divine favor or divine privilege that our Lord is king. When we might say, well, of course he's king, he's God. He's king as man because he won that. He won that with the sacrifice on the cross. And immediately, it's tied to his priesthood, or he is priest. Uh, our Lord on the cross is sacrificing himself to pay the price of our sin. He is priest. Not the priest or a priest. He is priest. Quintessential priest with a capital P. If anyone has sacrificed himself in order to pay the debt for our salvation, it is our divine Lord. He is priest. And in the moment that he is sacrificing himself to pay the price of our redemption, he's also becoming king. Not just king by some sort of, by the divine privilege because he's God. Not just king because the divine nature elevates the human nature in the hypostatic union. But he's king as man because he, he vanquished. He won that. He fought for it. He earned it. He deserves it. And it's very important to insist on our Lord being king as man. Because there's a tendency in modern man to say, oh, yes, yes, Christ is king. Yeah, I totally believe in that. We'll see all those realities when we get to heaven. Because that's where Christ is right now. But that kind of thinking, I would say, there's a word I don't usually use here, it belongs to the Freemasonry, the Freemasonic way of thinking. It's their way of saying, you know, maybe Christ is great and he's God and all the rest of it, and we'll see that in the next life. These enemies of the Catholic Church that I just mentioned, they don't, they will never admit that because Christ is king and he won it on the cross and he's king as man, that he has a right to dominate over us, dominate, rule us, rule over us as man. And we are men, and he's our king in charge of us. Everyone is constantly putting our Lord Jesus Christ sort of outside of the human fold and saying, yes, we recognize his divinity and his royalty and all the rest of it, but that's part of prayer. It's not part of real life. That's very unfortunate because our, Christ is king, our Lord Jesus Christ is king as man, and he rules men. For me, for me right now, it's particularly going through my mind because there's a, <laughs> there's a huge election on the line, so to speak. And um, definitely with one side, it's <laughs> Christ is not king at all in any way whatsoever. In fact, the positions of one side are completely against, over and over, against anything that has to do with Christ being king. And that's a pity. And it's, very real, it's a very realistic situation. And we've got here, the way we got here, so to speak, is generations and generations, or let's say even centuries, of people constantly chipping away at that thought. You know, Christ may be king, but he's king for the next world. He's not king for here. Until we get to this point where it's all about human rights, and human rights are completely bizarre now, the way people conceive of them. And the only one to lose is our divine Lord, Jesus Christ the King. I mean, really, we're the ones who lose by not having him rule over us. But still, that's man saying to Christ, you are not my king. You did not win my soul. You did not pay for my soul. I don't care if you did. You have no right to rule over me. It's completely against Christ the King. Uh, and this is not new stuff, by the way. When Pope Pius XI made this encyclical back in 1925, I guess it was, uh, 
communism was on the rise. And communism is all about take the presence of Christ out of society and pretend you can make a paradise on earth by saying uh, there's going to be a few people in charge. Everybody else has to uh, give all of their earnings, all of their livelihood to them. It's just putting other people, a few other people in the place of Christ the King. That's what that was. And that's why the Pope wrote this encyclical. And we put, he put this feast here so that we would fight against communism. Now a hundred years have passed. Uh, I think we're still fighting against the same enemy. But it really seems like the same enemy, which is this secularism and putting man in charge and taking God off of his throne. Uh, that's exactly where we are now. Only after the last judgment <clears throat> will he deliver the kingdom into the hands of the Father, that God may be all in all. And this will be the occasion when he will return with great power and majesty to judge the living and the dead. So when our Lord was here on earth, you know, 2,000 years ago, um, it was kind of a freebie. I don't mean to be disrespectful of that term. What he, he came with his... Um, divinity. He came with the authority of his father. His father blessed him in front of all of us, so to speak. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. His father gave the con uh, confirmation of whom, who he was. And you could accept him or reject him as you like. He was optional. He was not obligatory. Uh, and that's how he is in our life, too. You can follow him and get sanctified. You can reject him and really get damned, you know. Uh, but still, we have the impression that it's a take-it-or-leave-it situation. It's because it's the time of his mercy, this king. He's like the, the in the parable, the master, is, the master of the house who is sending out servants saying, invite people to my wedding, wedding, wedding feast. Invite people. Oh, you said that my, my, my friends rejected me? Well, then just forget about them. Now invite all the poor people and all the lame people. Just invite, invite, invite. I want anyone who can come here to come here. This is the time we're living in right now. But sooner or later, we're going to get to the time where the king or the master walks, walks into the dining room and finds the hall completely crowded, and he starts picking them out there. Well, only one of them is quoted to us in the, in the parable. This man doesn't have a wedding garment on. That means this man is not living in my grace. He's not living as a result of my precious blood. He's not living, uh, he does not have me in his heart and his soul as the king. Please take this man out and put him in the exterior darkness. Sooner or later that day is going to come. Right now it's a freebie. Our Lord's offering it to us. We can accept or reject. He's telling us to live in his grace. He's telling us to sacrifice all kinds of things in our heart which are not him. Occasions of sin, uh, how, we, um, how we're faithful to our state in life, what kind of work we have, how we're sanctifying ourselves there, and um, how we're being responsible in our duties. You know, he has the chance to reign in us right now. We have, or rather, we have the chance to make him reign in us right now. And are we taking the necessary steps to shed away all of our attachments so he can reign there? It's a very realistic issue. It's not just about the end of the world. It's about right now. Um, you know that um, in the Novus Ordo, so the more modernist way of observing the Catholic faith, they wait until the very end of the year, end of the year to celebrate this feast. They don't put it here. We put it here to show that you know, the saints are the result of the reign of Christ. And we celebrate all the saints in sort of a conglomerated way in just a few days. We're not aiming at the end of the year with that. We're sort of, we're making the statement they are the result of Christ's kingship. The Novus Ordo says, no, we're gonna wait till the end of the year because only at the second coming will we see that Christ reigns. That's very unfortunate and there's that thing again. That's that Freemasonry again, my old bugaboo. Um, they're trying to say Christ doesn't have a place in this world. This is false. If we start to think that, then we're not going to try to make Christ reign in my soul right now. Or we're going to say, maybe he does reign in my soul right now, but he doesn't have a right to reign in society outside or at large. And that's an error. Okay. 
Christ is God, he created this world. He, can, he must reign in it. The son, of, let's see, the son of man is anointed by the Son of God in the hypostatic union. He must reign. The Son of the man, our Lord Jesus Christ, died on the cross. He conquered and won our redemption. He's king in three different ways. And if you behave as if he's not, that's a great error. And we don't get sanctified that way. This is not essentially a kingdom of physical power, of usurping the kingdom of another, of gaining authority through intrigue and envy. It is the most powerful kingdom because it rules from the inside, not only from the outside. It uh, obliges a man's conscience. He's convinced. Whereas a man who's being forced to do, to do something, he's not always convinced. Disclaiming the title of king from an encompassing multitude of admirers, he refused both the name and the honor by fleeing from them and by lying hid. So different occasions on which our Lord's own people wanted to crown him king after the feeding of the 5,000. He escaped from their midst because he doesn't want to be this type of king that obliges you on the outside. He wants to be the type of king that convinces your soul. In the presence of the Roman governor, our Lord declared that his kingdom was not of this world. It is such a kingdom indeed as, it represent, as represented in the Gospels, into which men prepare to enter by doing penance. I told you about that, you know. We have the um, baptism into the death of Christ, and then immediately we are doing things which sacrifice our will so that God's will can be victorious in our soul by doing penance. But they cannot enter into this royalty except by faith and baptism, which although it is an external rite, nevertheless denotes and produces an interior regeneration. So what are we going to do to make sure that Christ reigns? Of course, we're going to try to make him reign in our church. You're doing that right now by observing the, 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 the practice of the Catholic faith in its traditional way. We're going to do everything we can to make him reign in our, governor, our governments. We're obedient citizens, and whenever we can, we have an influence a little bit to keep, make our countries uh, Catholic. And then also, we make him reign in our family by praying the rosary, by having uh, holy practices, by staying obedient, by not using foul language in the house, all these sort of things. We make him reign by observing our duties and then staying faithful to our state in life. Uh, but most of all, we've got to make our Lord Jesus Christ reign by uh, avoiding sin. Avoiding sin, and that is done by sacrificing ourselves. So this feast of Christ the King is kind of complex. You know, there's all these different levels at which our Lord Jesus Christ should reign. All of us, on our own part, we have to make sure that he reigns in our soul, and that is done by being faithful to our baptism and doing penance. Penance of what? Shedding away all that attachment to ourselves that we have so that Christ can reign in our soul. Pray to the Holy Mother of God. Pray to the Holy Mother of God that she make that happen in your soul. There's nothing that wins her more, or nothing that preoccupies her more than forming Christ in us because he was first formed in her, and now she wants to make sure that he's formed in all of us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.